Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to an evening PowerPoint presentation. We usually do uh, what I've always called lunch and learn on Fridays at noon, but we had some technical difficulties uh, today. So that's fine because now we're here and Reed and I are coming to you straight from Egypt, right? I am in Karnak. And where are you at, Reed? I'm way down south in Abu Simbel. Excellent. So uh, the, I, this Egypt adventure that we've been talking about is so spectacular. <clears throat> it's really some one of the best trips that I've done, and it really kind of ro rocked my world in a certain sense. Uh, and if you travel a lot in Europe and you're thinking about expanding out, Egypt is really, I think, one of the obvious first places uh, to go. What do you think, Reid? Well, absolutely. I mean, there's... Uh... Tourism is is huge in Egypt, so the infrastructure is really good there. I mean, it's still a you'd call it a developing world country, but you know they they are set up for tourism. The security's off the charts. I'll I'll actually show a couple of images of that as we go along tonight. But absolutely full of iconic sites, but also fantastic surprises that you wouldn't otherwise uh, expect. So I I think. Of all the itineraries we do together, Sarah, this one is the the most site rich. You know, uh, there's just every day you're you, it's sort of a jaw dropping thing. Whether it's the hypostyle hall behind you there in Karnak, or these the huge uh, uh, statues there at Abu Simbel, it's, it's big wow moments day after day. Yeah, and I think what makes this an especially exciting destination to visit is just that you've heard of this your whole life. You've heard of the Sphinx. You you actually see the Sphinx. You actually can go and like practically pat the Sphinx's bottom if you want. You, you've heard of the pyramids. You've heard of Karnak, and it's kind of a neat thing. Cruising the Nile is just crazy because you think, gosh, I've heard about this my whole life, and here I am on a riverboat cruising the Nile. So yeah, it's pretty neat. So here's what we're going to do, you guys, tonight. Uh, first of all, one thing that Reed and I wanted to tell you is both of our tours for 2022 are sold out and have waiting lists. You can certainly join the waiting list if you want to go. You're in March next year, right, Reed? Correct. March 10th. He's doing March next year and I'm doing uh, October of next year. However, because, you know, I'd love, love to get travel going as soon as possible, Egypt is already open. They're already taking uh, tourists. Not many are coming, but they are allowing tourists right now. So if you are an adventurous type and you want to get to see Egypt before all of the traveling hordes arrive again, as they certainly will, uh, I am willing to put together a group in November. So if you're interested in going this November, like the, before Thanksgiving, like the first couple of weeks of November, I would actually be totally into that. So email me if you're interested in that. In the meantime, I am going to let Reed take it away. I'm going to be going and making myself a Negroni, so I'm going to be here sipping a cocktail, and you guys can ask Reed questions, and I will monitor them on Facebook, and I'll ask those questions for you. So Reed, go ahead and take it away. All right. I just need to uh, share my screen here with everybody. Um, here we go. There we have it, and then we need to start this from the beginning here. Okay, I'm, Sarah, are you seeing what's on Facebook? This looks like it's probably wrong. That's the wrong presentation. Yeah, go the other way. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. All right, so, um, <sighs> Egypt, uh, you know, I, I think everybody knows where Egypt is there in the Middle East. It's in the news all the time and for our entire lives. But up in that northeastern corner of Africa, opposite the Middle East. Um, and one thing that didn't come up in Sarah and I chatting real quickly there is, is that our tour does include uh, three days in Jordan to finish up. So after you've seen those spectacular sights of Egypt, you get to zip over to next door uh, Jordan and see Petra and Wadi Rum, two absolutely world-class sites. Two sites that are as spectacular as anything that you'll see in Egypt, including the pyramids, including Abu Simbel, anything. So again, just a, a, a target-rich, site-rich uh, two-week itinerary. So um, basically, um, starting Cairo, work our way all the way south to Aswan, and Abu Simbel is a little further south of that, almost to Sudan. Then back up to Cairo, just to fly over to Amman, and uh, finish up over there in Jordan. So that's the itinerary that we do. 
We started in Cairo, obviously, and uh, first big site stop is the uh, Egyptian Museum, right? This is the old museum building, which overlooks Tahrir Square, which you'll all be familiar with from the Arab Spring in, in 2011, if for no other reason. Uh, right there in the heart of Cairo, Tahrir Square, is this old uh, uh, turn of the century building um, that houses something like uh, 20,000 Egyptian antiquities, uh, just a, a treasure trove of Egyptian antiquities. Now, we hope that um, maybe not by November, for those of you who jump on board for this last minute tour we're talking about, but those two tours that Sarah and I have scheduled for 2022, fingers crossed the new museum, which is supposed to open this year, but it's Egypt. So I, I'm not. I'm not counting those chick open. It's a fabulous new facility. So we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed that that will be ready to go. Oh, I just got a message that my internet is unstable. Is that what you're looking at, Sarah? Am I? We had a real quick little blip out, but you're good now. Okay. All right. So I wasn't saying anything that important, so I'm not going to go back and try to restate it. Anyway, uh, inside the museum, here's our good friend Hoda that you may have seen this week uh, on our Where in the World programs uh, with one of our groups. Just fabulous uh, artifacts everywhere you turn. This uh, uh, statue is just inside the doorway when you come in. I'm just going to sort of flash through these images because it is a museum. But when you've got a, an ace guide like Hoda to walk you through, sort of make sense out of it, give you a sort of a chronological sense. Um, but you can see a huge variety of, of types of antiquities. These painted statues here, um, more that are carved from marble or sandstone. These gorgeous little uh, these were little statuettes that came out of somebody's tomb, not something big and grand. King Tut's tomb. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I don't have any images of that because they don't allow any uh, photographs in King Tut's tomb. But of course, that is the highlight that you, uh, you know, there's an entire room with the antiquities that came out of King Tut's tomb, which of course, very famously, you know, uncovered in 1921, uh, had been undisturbed by uh the, the grave robbers like every other tomb in the valley of the kings and and it was just a spectacular treasure trove as everybody well knows uh sarcophagi here that that image is actually correct i took a picture of it from up above uh it's not upside down and then the next big site in egypt after a morning or an afternoon in the uh, in the museum is, of course, the Great Pyramid at Giza. This is the Pyramid of Cheops, the great one uh, that everybody knows. Uh, of course, it's an iconic moment for everybody. You go through the very, very um, rigorous security and you pop out of a door and there it is. It's really a kind of a spectacular uh, first moment to see the Great Pyramids. <clears throat> See it from a couple of different angles. By the way, um, a number of my images like this one are from 2016. When I took my first group to Egypt in 2016, it was still close enough to um, <clears throat> the Arab Spring that many, many travelers were still wary about going to Egypt. Uh, we had an intrepid group that decided to go and we really had a lot of opportunity to see things without the crowds. I'll, I'll say more about that a little bit later. In addition to the three great pyramids that are right there, there is, um, they they uncovered this ship, right, that was, I think, buried in somebody's tomb nearby, and they built this fabulous new uh, building to house the ship. You can see it's almost shaped like a ship itself. So this is what I'm talking about. I mean, they, they've spent money on their infrastructure to make sure that the visitor experience is always a positive one. And of course, everybody has to take that obligatory tourist shot of them standing on the pyramid, even though there, by the way, are signs everywhere that say don't climb, uh, but it, it's Egypt, so rules are more like suggestions. But um, 
anyway, you know, it gives you a sense of scale. You, everybody has seen pictures of the pyramids, like the first two that I showed you, where it looks like this big, smooth uh, structure. And the fact is that it is, you know, made out of these gigantic blocks. And so when you're up close there, or better yet, climbing right on it, um, you get a real sense of what, what an incredible engineering undertaking it was to actually create these things you know, 3,000 years ago. Um, it's easy to arrange getting your getting your photograph taken on a camel. I mean, here, here right by the pyramids, uh, we can help you arrange to be on a camel for like 15 minutes. They take you around, you take your fun photographs. You see the pyramids in the background there. Fun tourist uh, kitsch, um, readily available there. And then as Sarah had mentioned in the introduction, Take you right next door to see the Sphinx, of course. Uh, uh, and you can see, again, the, the pyramids right there in the background. And uh, you get very, very close to the Sphinx. And uh, I think here's the shot Sarah was thinking of where you can almost reach out and pat the Sphinx on the bum there. And then um, for those who want to, it's pretty easy to arrange an additional camel ride. I, these are all optional things, right? Uh, um, uh, in my groups, about uh, 10 or a dozen from each group wants to do the extra, extra camel ride to ride out into the desert uh, at the end of the day. So here's a group of people with me in 2016. And this is the vantage that you get when you ride out into the desert on the camels. Uh, by it's at, if you do it at the end of the day, um, you end up with the sun in the right place for great photographs. The only thing that's not so nice, of course, is that you get you know sprawling Cairo in the background there. Here's a nice iconic shot uh, of the camels and then the pyramids in the background. And by the way, I just want to point out. I don't know if you can follow my pointer, but these are little Bedouin gatherings on those small hills here where they, they're just gathering to have tea and light a fire. And, uh, you know, I think it's quite typical to be invited to join them. I, I have been done, I have been invited each time I've been there. And uh, here's a, a beautiful shot that we got at sunset there with the Bedouins gathering on the hilltop. Looks like something out of either Indiana Jones or Lawrence of Arabia there, doesn't it? Got to have your tourist shot. Love this one because there's the pyramids right there in the background. All right. Cairo has a lot more to offer other than just, uh, well, not just the pyramids and just the archaeological museum. I mean, those, those but those are the two big guns. Um, but right in, in the center of Islamic Cairo, there is a uh, tr tremendous fort, the uh, citadel, it's called, uh, the Citadel of Muhammad Ali. It's from the 13th century, and it was the seat of government for the 13th and the 19th centuries. Big complex there. Whoops, sorry, going the wrong way. Minaret. And then inside is the Mosque of Muhammad Ali. So this is our first uh, visit to a mosque. There are a number of important and grand mosques in Islamic Cairo. We will always visit a couple of them while we're there. Uh, but of course, before you go into a mosque, um, women need to have their heads covered. Uh, everybody has to take their shoes off. That's part of be, you know, traveling, at, traveling as a temporary Muslim. And here's our ace guide, Hoda, who has brought her uh, collection of scarves from her own closet and is helping everybody tie on the hijab. I mean, this this was sort of a practical, uh, pragmatic need of the tour, but it, it was so much fun. Sarah, didn't your group have a, a, a good time when all the women put the hijabs on before you went into the mosque? Oh, we really did. We had a great time. And actually what I thought was really enlightening about it is when Hoda explains wearing the hijab, a lot of people think, oh, you know, you, if you're wearing a hijab, that's oppressive or, you know, women, they're forced to do this. No, they choose to. And actually, Hoda tells the story about how she started wearing a hijab when she, her parents didn't even like force her to do it. 
Uh, and what's really nice is when you're wearing it, it, it serves a practical purpose in a sense. Number one, no bad hair days. And number two, if there's ever dust or wind or something like that, it keeps that out of your hair. So there are practical aspects to it. I thought it was really fun. I thought it looked really pretty. And then also it just, for me, made me feel very comfortable walking around Cairo. I kept it on the whole day. I didn't have to, but I did. And I felt like that was kind of a, just part of the experience, you know? Yeah, I think it didn't Hoda share with us that that her mother was quite a modern progressive type and didn't herself wear a hijab, but Hoda just on her own decided that that's what the, that's the way she wanted to go and that's the way she's become comfortable. So, yeah, well, and fun. women can can kind of choose. So it's it's a really fun lesson, and she ties them in so many different ways. It's so fun to watch her because I think she did maybe five or six different styles, and then we all got to kind of practice it. So it's one of the little lovely things that we do that you don't expect on a, a tour. It's a little bit more of a personal thing. Right. Great. Great cultural connection experience. I think. Um, once you enter the courtyard there at the mosque, there's always the place where the ceremonial sort of a, a sacred ablutions have to take place. A Muslim will always go and wash their hands uh, symbolically before they enter the mosque. That's what's going on here. Then inside, you can see we're all in our stocking feet. Learning about Muslim worship there. And then this particular mosque has just got these spectacular domed ceiling with all those lamps hanging. It makes quite a striking uh, impression on you when you enter and you see all the, uh, all the Arabic script up there in the dome. And then my favorite sort of urban activity um, in, in Islamic Cairo is Khan El Khalili Bazaar, right? This is sort of the, the shopping district. There's a number of streets and then between them, uh, tons and tons of little alleys, all of which are offering uh, every, every kind of clothing or goods that you can possibly imagine. It's a souvenir hunter's paradise. Um, <clears throat> so after the Citadel, we head down to Khan El Khalili, do a little bit of explorations. Now, my next shot is not the best image that I have, but I absolutely had to put it in here. This is out of the front windshield of our bus. You can see the little imprint tours that we've got in the window there. That, that's a full 45 seat bus, 13 meters, 40 feet long. And he's going to drive it up that street. And actually, he's just come around a corner. It's absolutely amazing. And, and, no, and you would think that people would get looks of terror on their faces and flee. But it must be a fairly regular occurrence to bring a, a full size bus right down through Khan El Khalili. It's, it's a miracle. I would also comment, Reed, that um, what's fascinating about bringing a bus around Cairo is how you feel like a dignitary because you have a police escort, which may seem a little odd, but people are really, they treasure and value tourists in Egypt. They really do. And I felt like everywhere we went, people bent over backwards to make our group comfortable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another sort of iconic experience within Khan El Khalili is uh, Fashawis. Fashawis is a, um, a tea house, uh, a hookah bar that's, that's been around for hundreds of years. And we always end up at some point there. Excuse me, sometimes we actually have our lunch there, but at the very least we stop and everybody gets a drink, either a fresh fruit drink or a tea or a coffee drink. Here's one of our groups. Here's the way they serve coffee there. And, and of course, if you want a, a regular drip coffee or a latte or something, you can get that as well. But if you want the traditional Egyptian coffee, this is the way it comes. Got to try the hookah, right? It's kind of a, uh, I, I've never been a smoker in any way in my life, but this is kind of a pleasant way. It's a, a very minty flavor. Of course, you can get different, you can get fruit flavors. Um, this is, you know, you know, getting your, getting your hands dirty in the culture, making the cultural connection. You know, I don't smoke, but I wanted to try this. So had a little hookah there. And then we eventually, after everybody's had time to shop and explore a little bit, we gather together again and walk on out to where we meet the bus. There's some gorgeous buildings there in central Cairo. <clears throat> and uh, you see all kinds of things on the way out. I don't really know what the story is here, why you've got these sort of marionette type figures there, life-size on a little balcony of a house. 
And um, Sarah was just saying how friendly people are. And this was that opportunity as you wander the streets and stuff to, to meet people, to strike up a conversation. And of course, my daughter with her almost blonde hair was a kind of a magnet. And everywhere we went, people wanted to meet her, shake her hand, introduce themselves, take pictures, quite often ask her to be their Facebook <laughs> friends. Um, she was quite the attraction, but any Westerner is going to attract that kind of attention. And I, I would say it's a good attention, right? In India, it's, it's a little bit too much, but in Egypt, it's so friendly, it's so warm, so welcoming. Um, that's just part of the experience that and, uh, Cher, uh, Sarah was mentioning that. This is, this is not an accident. I did put this image in on purpose. You don't see this around every corner, but it is Egypt. It is a developing country. There's, you know, there's going to be some uh, uncomfortable things to see, to experience, and you just got to learn to compartmentalize a little bit. I always feel like it's unfair to try to hide from people um, the negatives of a country. So this is just a street that would, had turned into a bit of a garbage dump, it looks like. Um, next stop on our itinerary, something that we usually do. Um, I always want to be careful in the PowerPoint presentations not to promise anything because our itinerary does change and morph as we go along and we discover that some things are successful, some things not so much. Um, this is the Geyer Anderson Museum. It's a, a 17th century merchant house. Uh, and uh, we stopped there just to get a little bit of that slice of life. Uh, there was a James Bond movie that was filmed in Egypt and there's a fight scene that takes place here. Just kind of an interesting look at Cairo, you know, 2,500 years ago, about the time our country was getting started. And then right next door is my favorite mosque visit. This is Ibn Taloun Mosque. Uh, this is one of the oldest mosques, not only in Cairo and in Egypt, but in all of Africa. Uh, it was the foundations go back to the ninth century. Uh, and I just love that that stylistic uh, uh, minaret there to the right of the screen. It's just lovely. And uh, in this particular mosque, rather than just having you go barefoot, they give you these fun little goofy looking uh, shoe covers. So I thought I'd show you a picture of that. Whatever we do in Cairo, we end up the day up at Azure Park, which is a park up on a hill that looks over, out to the west over the city. It's a great place to enjoy the sunset. And we have uh, what might be the best meal uh, in all of the tour up there in Azure Park. By the way, um, let me go back. Since I, since I mentioned the meal, I will say this. Egypt is not a culinary destination in my book. I mean, uh, the, the food is, it's hearty and it's savory, but it's not exciting. It's not like going to Italy or France or Vietnam or, or Thailand. Uh, food is a little more humdrum there. So it's, it's not a place that's a, a particular uh, excitement for foodies, um, but, there, but we do manage to have some really interesting and fun meals while we're there. Um, that's it for Cairo, but before we leave the Cairo area and head south to Luxor and the Nile, um, we go to Dashur, where there are two other quite interesting temples. This is the, uh, sorry, pyramids. This is the Red Pyramid. You can see very similar to the Great Pyramid of Cheops at Giza. It's just a little bit smaller scale. And what I love about it is it's included in the price of entrance to go into the pyramid, right? You can go into the Great Pyramid at Giza, but it's always a line. It's always stuffy and crowded and clammy, uh, and they charge you a whole bunch extra to go. Whereas here at the Red Pyramid, very rarely are there pretty much any other pe people there, and if so, just a handful. So it's very, very easy to uh, have that experience of being inside uh, the pyramid. And the other one is the Bent Pyramid, uh, named for obvious reasons. Um, I, I just have to chuckle every time I see this one. They, they started building it. This is a, a much older, uh, or I should say earlier pyramid than the Great Pyramids of Giza. And they were building it at, at too steep an angle and they, it began to uh, crumble and crack. 
the foundations. They realized they couldn't keep going up at that angle. And rather than undoing all that work, they just changed the angle about halfway up to make it stable, the bent hey, pyramid. Hey, Reed, we got a couple of questions. Um, oh. One is, uh, is alcohol drinking allowed in Egypt? Absolutely. Now, uh, um, typically Muslims don't drink, um, but they have no qualms about us drinking. Uh, you know, cold beer is readily available. Um, wine is not something that I think you want to drink in Egypt unless it's been imported, but then it gets quite expensive. Um, and then there's a variety of Egyptian hard liquors that are available as well. But absolutely, there's no stigma attached to we as visitors having al alcoholic drinks. And what we did, just to let everybody know, is because it can be challenging to find alcohol. And if you do, you find it in the hotels and it's quite expensive. Uh, you, the, actually, Hoda and I, <laughs> in the dark of night, got into a taxi cab in Luxor and went to God knows where and found a liquor store. And we bought like three cases of beer and wine and vodka and rum. And basically we brought it back and I just sold it to the group for whatever I paid for it so that people could have it with them and drink in their rooms if they liked. And it actually ended up being very, very funny because we got stuck in a, in a sandstorm on the boat uh, on the Nile and we were all stuck. We couldn't go anywhere. So we all just went and collected our alcohol stash and had a party. <laughs> so that's a great question. And uh, the other question was, uh, do people speak English in Egypt? Absolutely. Now, I won't say that every single person that you encounter speaks English, but anybody who's involved in the tourism infrastructure, hotel, restaurants, etc., the people on the boats, they all speak passable English and, and many of them speak it very well. Remember that um, while not a, a British colony, Egypt was a, was a British protectorate uh, for quite a bit of the 19th century. So a lot of Egyptians had their education in the British system. So English is a pretty strong second language there. Did you, did you encounter any difficulties with English, Sarah? I never did. Um, I didn't really because we were mostly in touristic places and there would always be somebody who could speak a little bit of English. But of course, as I always tell everybody, everywhere you go, learn the basics in the local language, which is Arabic. So you want to learn sabal here, for example, like hello, good morning. You want to learn please and thank you, which is something we do on the tour. We do little language lessons. Right. Absolutely. Um, I, I just left a picture of the lunch that we have uh, on that uh, Dasher day. Um, another one of the really good meals during the tour. Like I said, very hearty. There's some, there's some uh, grape leaves there, like, like you might find in Greece and samosa type things. Um, <clears throat> and before we go, this is the uh, pyramid at um, Zakara, which is one of the oldest pyramids. It predates all the others. We don't stop there, but we do drive by uh, enough to, to have a little drive by photograph. Um, after this lunch, then we head out to the airport and we fly south to Luxor. And here's just showing you on the map um, about where Luxor is, about halfway down Egypt. So that's, that's a long way to go. There is a train, but we, uh, we just fly this little leg of the tour. And first stop in Luxor is mighty Karnak Temple. Um, this is, in my opinion, the most impressive impressive temple complex in all of Egypt. And in the, in the entry hall there, like I said, really good tourist infrastructure, they created this model that shows you the complex as it was um, before, you know, it began to crumble into ruin. I mean, it's still impressive, but it doesn't look quite the way that it did in its, uh, in its heyday there. These are the great uh, walls of the, the entryway. And um, if you look on either side of the walkway that leads to the temple complex, you see rows and rows of sphinxes there with ram's heads. I'll show you a picture of that uh, close up in a little bit. This is a very big complex and it's a, it's, a, it's a morning's worth of exploration to be sure. And of course, we're not just gonna turn you, I mean, we will turn you loose to explore on your own and take photographs, but not before you get a really good explanation of the temple and its history and, and the significance of the hieroglyphs that are everywhere. And for me, and I, I'm, I'm gonna guess that Sarah is gonna agree since she chose it for her background photograph, the hypostyle hall is the real 
the wow moment within the wow moment, right? The, the, uh, the whole temple complex is impressive when you see it from the outside. Then as you get in, you come into this hall where there are these immense um, columns. I'm not sure that I have uh, a, a, a per, I, th I think I have a picture of a person here in a minute to give you a sense of scale. And you can see that every single column is adorned with, uh, with, petro uh, with hieroglyphics. A couple of close-ups here to show you how exquisite the work is. The scale is one of those things that you just can't describe to people. They have to go and see it because, I mean, I studied Karnak in architecture school. I remember that, that I mean, that's one of the most important architectural sites of the ancient world. But when you're actually there, it just, it, it, you can't experience it in a photograph. It's so, the scale is so sh shocking for that age. So it really is one of those things where you just kind of gasp when you see it. It's so beautiful. Right. And here's the best I can do with that, where I've got this man here. And, and if he was standing right next to the column, it would be even more pronounced. I'm going to get, I'm just going to throw a number out there and say that that column is 15 feet, 18 feet in diameter. I mean, they're really, really big. And the part that you just can't capture in an image is, is how vast this hall is. Everywhere you look, you don't get to see very far because uh, you know, the, the, the columns in the foreground begin to block out those that are further back. So this is an immense hall with these immense columns. There's a, a really impressive obelisk that still stands in the center of the complex. And then there's, you know, everywhere you turn, there are um, things to photograph and enjoy. Here's that row of sphinxes that I mentioned before. Um, there's, there's more than just those at the entryway. Um, and there used to be a road that went from Luxor Temple all the way in the center of town, about a mile and a half away, that lined the roadway all the way out to Karnak Temple. Very, very important religious center here. On the second day that we're in Luxor, we cross the river to the west bank of the Nile. And the west bank of the Nile is where all of the, uh, it's where the Valley of the Kings is, the Valley of the Queens, where, where one finds all the tombs that, of course, we all know about. These are the Colossi of Memnon. Um, <clears throat> these are um, uh, actually statues of Amenhotep III, who was a, a pharaoh in the 14th century BC, but the name, Colossae of Memnon comes from the Roman period there, um, where they thought these were statues uh, of, um, of a, a king of Ethiopia named Memnon, who went and, and was fought at um, uh, the Battle of Troy in the, in the Iliad. So, and the name just stuck, stuck right? The Colossae of Memnon. Um, but that's one of the first things you come to as you cross over to the west side, really impressive. You know, you can see that, that the ravages of time have not been kind to these two, but they're still so impressive because they're so such a grand scale. This is the Valley of the Kings, and you can see lots of people there. Um, and, uh, and then left and right, left and right, as you work your way up the valley are all the various tombs that, they, that have been discovered and excavated. And there, you know, no matter, we, we'll, we'll always pick two or three to visit. We'll give people free time because you can enter others if you want to. Um, they're all impressive uh, and they all look a, something like this. They all have that sort of shotgun design, takes you into the hillside. Um, always sort of a, I'll call it the Holy of Holies, all the way in the, in the far interior where there is quite often a stone sarcophagi in which the various, um, you know, stone, then wood, then metal sarcophagi, and then, you know, that likeness of the, of the Pharaoh that was buried there and then his mummified body. Do you happen to know, Reed, what kind of stone these are made out, out of that they've lasted so long? I really don't, but I'm going to say, I'm going to just take a stab and say sandstone. If, uh, if anybody out there knows better, let us know. But uh, I'm going to say correct. sandstone because it's solid, but still it's not like granite, right? That's so hard to tunnel into. Yeah, I, I have the same impression. I, I seem to recall it being sandstone. And of course, I mean, you know, I mean, everything is impressive, but, you know, 
God is in the details. Boy, there's there's so many details that are still in such beautiful condition, including the colors that have survived. Um, and, and remember, we're talking, we're not talking about hundreds year, of years old, like the things that we're so impressed with when we go to Europe. We're talking thousands of years old, these tombs. So the carvings, the paintings, uh, really quite electric in a number of these tombs. Uh, you know, most of them are scarred up in some way, but but still just really impressive. And and including the ceilings, you know, the ceilings are decorated as well. Here, oh, here's one at the bottom of the of the image here. I lost my oops, I didn't know that would happen. Um, at the bottom, here's the big stone sarcophagi. They've sarcophagus. They've left it in this one. Um, this is not a very good shot, but I wanted you to see that this is more typical. Um, you know, in 2020, when Sarah and I were both there with, with our, our respective groups, you know, tourism was back in force. And, uh, you know, going into these tombs, you weren't, you know, all my pictures with nobody in them are from 2016. So tourism is back, or at least it was. And then um, this is the uh, Temple of Hatsep. Hatshepsut, <laughs> easy for me to say. <laughs> um, this is in the Valley of the Queens, and uh, this is this is a, a partial reconstruction. That's why it's in such uh, really good shape. Um, Hatshepsut was a, a a pharaoh in the 15th century, and am I remembering correctly, Sarah, that she was a woman? Am I? Yeah, she's a, a woman, and she basically ruled like a man. And what I this is Hoda's very favorite. Uh, uh, Pharaoh, because apparently she even had herself portrayed like a man <laughs> in art. <laughs> so when you look at the images of her, you think it's a, a male Pharaoh. Yeah, and, and she was the first female Pharaoh, and she kind of just took the reins of power, if I remember uh, the history that Hoda shared with us, just sort of forced her way into power. And, and you know, a woman who just said, you know, enough of this male-dominated society, I'm going to order things a little more to my own liking. But you see it hugs up right against the cliffs. It's just an impressive venue. Back in Luxor, um, we don't visit Luxor Temple. Um, you know, I feel quite strongly about not going into every single temple that we come across. Luxor Temple is impressive. But there's there's plenty of opportunities to be out in the evening when we're there. The first night we're there, we stay in a hotel before we get onto our Nile boat. So most people go. And if, if you want to pay and, and enter the temple, you can. But I took this shot from outside of the gates. It's always impressive at night. And uh, there's a little bit of a story to that obelisk. Those of you who have been to Paris will be familiar with its pair, right? With its matching counterpart, which was uh, given to the French and stands in the Place de la Concorde um, there um, at the end of the Champs-Élysées, between the Champs-Élysées and the, um, uh, the Louvre. You, you see the, the, the sister or brother obelisk to this one that was traded to the French for a clock. And the clock, by the way, is up in the Citadel. I didn't show you a picture of that because it's not a very impressive clock. The French got the better part of that trade. <laughs> um, one of the options available there in Luxor that's kind of a no miss is a, is a Dawn hot air balloon ride. I've, I've done hot air balloons in a number of countries and the valley, this, this one on the west bank of the Nile and the one in um, Bagan in Myanmar are by far the best hot air balloon experiences to be had. You know, just a beautiful dawn liftoff. And then you just drift slowly wherever the, wherever the wind takes you and gives you that bird's eye view of uh, the west side that you can't get in any other way. There's that temple of Hatshepsut that I can't pronounce. <laughs> Hatshepsut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this, I think this is the workman's village. This is next to uh, the Valley of the Queens. This is, uh, on, on, you know, the tombs of, of noblemen, but not pharaohs, right? And the, the place you can see is just filthy with them. There's that same temple again. And 
And you're not alone, right? There's This is a popular thing to do. I would say, Reed, that um, in all of the hot air balloon experiences I've had in different parts of the world, I always try to do it if it's available because it's always a good experience no matter where you go. I would say this comes pretty close to being the best. Uh, I think Cappadocia is another one that's almost like almost unmatchable, but this gets real close because in no other way could you really get a survey of the Valley of the Kings and the Queens because it's such a vast area. And when you're in the, the vans, you can't really understand how it's all laid out. So I really recommended this to my group and everybody who went was, it was just jaw dropping. It was just yeah. a jaw dropping experience. Yeah. It, and it's it's a little bit pricey, but I've never had anybody come back and say, well, you know, it was so-so. You know, it's it, typically everybody's com on a complete high, um, no pun intended, um, after they come down from the balloons. Um, I put this shot in just because it so dramatically shows how the Nile is the lifeblood of the country. That's the Sahara Desert that comes right up and almost like someone has drawn a line. And of course the Nile is there off to the, to the left side of the image. Um, you know, wherever they can pump water from the Nile, they can bring life. And then as, as soon as they reach the extent of that irrigation system, boom, desert. Quite dramatic in this shot, I think. All right, after a couple of days of sightseeing in Luxor, um, we're ready to sail south. Uh, we, the, we spent the first night on the boat, or sorry, the second night in Luxor we've spent on the boat, but then on the third day, we're ready to sail um, south. And we go from Luxor down to Aswan. But I just wanna point out a couple things on this map uh, before we um, move on to the next image. Edfu and Komombo are the two temple stops that we make on the cruise. Aswan, we've got lots of images to show you, but that's where the dam is, right? The high Aswan dam that creates Lake Nasser down here at the bottom. And then all the way down just to the left of the, of the Google symbol, you see Abu Simbel. So that's basically the rest of the tour, right? The, 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 um, the Nile cruise, Aswan, Abu Simbel, and then we're off to uh, Jordan after that. Here's one of the Nile boats. You know, they're not exactly elegant, but they're, they're purpose built, right? To have lots of cabins, a beautiful dining room and a nice deck on top. And for that, they function beautifully. All of them have, you know, some sort of rooftop terrace uh, where when the sun is shining, it's the place to be. You can see to the right there, there's a little bar set up. They always have a little coffee and cake service in the afternoon that's part of the cruise. Great place to hang out and just uh, watch the scenery go by. Um, I'm not sure going forward in the post-COVID world uh, what will happen food-wise, but up until now, these cruises are three buffet meals a day, right? Breakfast is a buffet, lunch is a buffet, dinner is a buffet. Uh, as a matter of fact, we all got a little weary of buffets. But of course, the advantage is you, you eat what you want and you eat as much of what you want. So um, always a buffet meal. And uh, this is the sort of thing you might see drifting by on the Nile. That, by the way, in the foreground is all papyrus, right? That's what the old ancient scrolls were made out of. Uh, you'll see various tombs and structures occasionally. And then at other parts of the river, you will see where the Sahara comes right down to the river and the dunes just sort of empty out right into the Nile. And one thing I would add to this is that, you know, I'm not really a big fan of cruises, honestly. I would always encourage people not to take cruises, but this is something different. You can't really put that into that category because this is like a floating hotel. It's not a cruise ship in like they have a tour director on board and they have a pool. It's not at all. It's like a little floating family run hotel. The staff are so sweet. And at least on our boat, they
they tried to have theme nights. So one night they decorated up the dining hall differently. And um, the people who make your food and do all that stuff are also the ones that are cleaning your cabins. They were so funny because every day they do these little um, towel animals, you know, and they'd wait to see if we like them. And it just becomes like a big floating family in a way because you really get to know the people who work on board. So it's not the same kind of cruise ship tourism that maybe you are familiar with for like the giant boats because these are quite small, right? Oh, and the other thing, we we put you on a four-star boat. Is it four-star, Reed? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually, it's five stars, Sarah. But no! it's, but it's, it's <laughs> yes, it's Egyptian five stars. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't call it. I wow, I would not call it five star for sure. It's nice. I would say, you know, I just took a trip down to California. I stayed in comfort inns and um, things like that. It's on par with kind of a nice mid-range kind of hotel in the United States. It was, it was fine. It's just not. It's not five star. <laughs> It, it, it is their five star, but I'm, I'm really glad this has come up because if you go in there thinking this is going to be this super cushy, luxurious thing, uh, it's not. It's, but it's, it's the top of the line boat for the Nile, though, honestly. Um, and then wherever we stop, of course, we, you know, we pile into a bus to go see whatever the local site is. You can see big, comfortable air conditioned buses. And, uh, and this is what Sarah was talking about earlier. This Egyptian fella standing over here on the left with the vest is our personal escort slash guide. And he's packing heat. He's got a pistol under that vest. And that's what he's there for is to protect us. It's a little unnerving until you kind of figure out what's going on. Um, he's with us wherever we go. He kind of... Uh, uh, brings up the rear of the group quite often and, and assists Hoda making sure that her little uh, band of kittens doesn't straggle too far. Um, but he is there for our protection. And then when we're ready to pull out, there's a vehicle always in front of us, sometimes one in front, sometimes one in back. These are all armed guards and they have one job and that's to protect us, to protect the tourists. You know, they're, you know, with, with, with radical Islam on the rise all across the globe, the Egyptians understand that, that tourists could be targets. So they have an extremely high profile, efficient security system in place. Uh, and, as soon as, uh, and as soon as you realize that all these guns that you keep seeing that maybe are making you a little bit nervous, they're really there for your protection. And then when you arrive at your destination, whatever your site is, a temple or whatnot, there's a checkpoint. All the paperwork has to be in order. There's a couple of guys like this on either side. Nobody gets in without the proper credentials. So um, they, they take the uh, security quite seriously. And, and I, the, when I was there in 2016, I have to tell you, it was fairly shortly, at, you know, five years after the Arab Spring and tourism was just coming back. And everybody was a little bit nervous for about a day and a half. But as soon as you saw what was going on, as soon as you saw how grateful people were that we were there, um, you just relaxed. And I felt as safe there as I have anywhere else in the world. Um, this is uh, Edfu Temple. This is uh, probably the best preserved temple on the Nile. Uh, certainly it's the best preserved of the ones that we visit. So you can see just a beautiful exterior facade there, beautifully carved. And, and, and uh, you arrive there first thing in the morning always. So it's always a, a great uh, time for photographs. It faces to the east, so it's perfect in the morning. Here's the inner courtyard. Um, something that I thought of but didn't mention when we were looking at the uh, images of Karnak is that um, you'll notice the tops of all the columns, the capitals, um, that are meant to be stylized papyrus, right? That, that sort of, you might think those are sort of acanthus leaves like a Corinthian column, but that is meant to be the stylized reeds of the papyrus plant. And that's, that's typical of pretty much every temple that we visit. Here you see them again. You see the spreading stalks at the top. <clears throat> And then, of course, there's the details. There's Horus. There's Horus again. I, I think this temple is dedicated to Horus. He's pretty much everywhere, the falcon god. 
here's a a, a, a um, what's the word? I I'm I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, you get this as, as jewelry with your name on it. What am I trying to say, Sarah? I don't want to put you on the <laughs> Oh, Reed, you put me on the spot. Um, it is, uh, oh. It, you know, it'll, it'll come to me later. Any, anyway, it's, yeah, it's somebody's name. Anytime you see this. this, this cartouche, oh, cartouche. Cartouche, thank you. There it, was, it was too easy for both of us. But um, you know, anytime you see this cartouche shape, right? This sort of oblong track shape with a little tail on the bottom, that's somebody's name, right? And, and Hoda would knows enough hieroglyphics that she would be able to tell us the name of this person, right? By reading the hieroglyphs. And there's Horace one last time standing sentry out by the entrance. And then the second stop is Colombo. And uh, I've only done this a handful of times, this Nile cruise, but every time the boat is delayed uh, by an hour or two and you're getting there just at dusk, which should be part of the plan anyway, because you get to see plenty of temples in daylight. But this is the only time that you actually get to arrive at and tour a temple as, as dusk falls and the lights come up and it's really quite magical. Uh, Kamumbo is dedicated to, I forget his name, he's the crocodile god. Lots of crocodiles in the, uh, uh, in the carvings here. And then the final, the final stop after a couple days of cruising is Aswan. And Aswan ends up being, I think, just about everybody's favorite. It's so it's so lovely there. You can see here in these first couple of shots, you wake up there in the morning. Uh, the sun is shining across the Nile to the West Bank where the, the dunes of the Sahara come right down to the river. Um, and then there's all the felucas with their Latin sails everywhere. It's just so picturesque. There's some of the felucas. You see the, the sands of the Sahara coming right down to the Nile. And if you're going to be in Rome, you do as the Romans do. So we load up in our own felucca, have a sail in the afternoon. This is the old Cataracts Hotel. It's sort of the storied uh, 19th century hotel right in the middle of the Nile. Um, whenever we have time, we, you know, take some of our group there to have a tea or a coffee or something with the beautiful views out over Elephantine Island. Um, Aswan has a number of colorful and fun markets. So Hoda usually takes everybody into the market to buy spices or silks or, or cartouches. She's just uh, giving people samples here. And then what I think is the highlight of our stay in Aswan is a visit to the Nubian village. I think this is what you missed, Sarah. I think this was sandstorm day for you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, it's really a, a, a highlight. We go to Elephantine Island where uh, the Nubians, right, which is a, a, an ethnic group from southern, from northern Sudan and southern Egypt. Uh, they're their own, you know, ethnic and cultural group. They've maintained their traditions, their their lifestyles. Um, and we're guests of this gentleman here on the left, who's the patriarch of a Nubian family. Um, and he kind of gives us a little mini tour of the village. And then we retire to the family home. This is a multi-generational home. Uh, and, uh, and we have dinner there, right? Everybody's uh, tucked in there tight, right? But it's a, a fun evening. They bring out this spread. It's a great meal. It's Nubian cuisine rather than Egyptian cuisine. Um, and we are their guests for the evening. Um, sometimes if there's time, then someone will come in and uh, do henna for everybody, if, uh, for anybody who wants a henna tattoo. And then on to Abu Simbel. I mean, there's a couple other things in Aswan, but uh, primarily it's the Felucca ride and the, the uh, Nubian explorations and meal. 
um, but we uh, we cross by near the Great High Aswan Dam and then head out into the desert. It's about a three and a half hour drive. We've got one of those comfortable coaches that I showed you before. And the goal is Abu Simbel. Um, this is the temple of Ramses II. I think everybody remembers the story in the 1960s when they built the High Aswan Dam to create Lake Nasser. This was going to be inundated by the, by the floodwaters. So UNESCO organized a rescue and they cut this into blocks and moved it uphill so that it would stay preserved. It was just an amazing engineering feat. Here's our group out front. Hoda teaching us the history here. By the way, if you notice something about these four pictures, there's nobody in them, <laughs> right? <laughs> my, this is 2016, my group, we weren't the only, we were the only people there, the only people there. And uh, I wanna make a fuss about this because this is the opportunity for, for those of you who think you want to dive right in and go with Sarah in November this year. Um, I think it's going to be the same. I mean, this is the post COVID world. Pe people are waiting for everything to be just perfect for those that are a little bit intrepid and willing to push the envelope a little bit. I think you're going to have one of these kind of spectacular solo travel experiences that's almost impossible these days as, as middle-class tourism has exploded in our, in our own lifetimes uh, and Europe has become incredibly crowded. And then these uh, around the globe, the places that are attractive and that you know people want to see and experience, there's almost always a crowd issue. I think that the, the, the tour that we're putting together for November and maybe even the one that I've got going in March are gonna be just at the front of the curve. And probably you're gonna have a nice balance of, of a return to normalcy, but also uh, an opportunity to experience places like this, like this without a million other people. Well, and I would say we had, I mean, for very different reasons, we had the same experience in uh, Abu Simbel and actually for almost everywhere else because we were the last group out of Egypt. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. But it was absolutely magical to basically be the only people there for that sound and light show at night. That was incredible. The hotel was not great, but the, it didn't matter because it was so, such an incredible sound and light show um, that just really... Yeah, it was striking. I mean, I'll never forget that. That was amazing to be the only bus in the parking lot. Right. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, here's a here's your shot to give you a sense of scale, right? The the pieces of the head and upper torso that have fallen down from that second image of Ramses II. This is just this is so impressive. Uh, Karnak and Abu Simbel are just so such powerful experiences i think um i mean the pyramid might even suffer a little bit because of expectations you know i i i was impressed when i saw it but i don't know somehow that hypostyle hall at karnak and then these these gigantic figures and and i guess that story of how they were chopped into pieces and moved uh just was so impressive I'll just move quickly through these close-up shots, and believe me, I've got about a hundred more of every one of these because you're, you know, you're, you're just click, 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 clicking. You can't absorb it fast enough when you're there, and of course, uh, Im images are all lovely, but the proximity experience, right? The, the actually to be here is so much more powerful. Um, the, there's the secondary temple, the temple of of Hathor, uh, de dedicated to Hathor, but built in honor of Ramses II's wife, Nefertari. This is right next door. And if, you know, I think it kind of gets short shrift because it's it's not as, as large, it's not as grand. But, but if that temple to Ramses II wasn't just 50 yards away, this would be the, the gobstopper, right? This would be the one where your mouth would drop to the floor. And Sarah had mentioned the sound and light show. This is uh, reputed to be the best sound and light show in Egypt. I don't know. It's the only one I've seen in Egypt, but it's, it's an impressive evening. And uh, this shot is a, a first light in the morning shot uh, that I got back in 2016. 
And here's the, the hotel that Sarah mentioned. She's absolutely right. The hotel itself uh, was, was really not nice. But look at this view of Lake Nasser and the swimming pool and walking distance to Abu Simbel, which is why I chose it. Uh, we're, we, for all of you who are starting to shake in your boots, we're upgrading for, for our next round of tours. Um, but this staying in this place is what allowed us to anybody who wanted to to run over and get those first lights of the morning uh, shots. Yeah, this was such a shame because that hotel is amazing. Like the location and the pool area is gorgeous. But yeah, <laughs> you just wish they'd invest in it. <laughs> um, okay, uh, that, that sort of completes the Egypt section. I've got the map back up again, just to reorient everybody. We fly back to Cairo and spend one night just right out at the airport. Uh, beautiful business class hotel. It's a nice place for everybody to just, you know, get sort of rested up after your 10 days in, in Egypt and it's, and the, the, uh, uh, a, the energy constraints or, or restraints that happen there. Uh, and then we fly on and first thing in the morning to Amman and Jordan. And from Amman, we head all the way south down to Wadi Musa, which is the uh, life support town for the ancient city of Petra. Uh, and the, the route we take is not this exact one that I got on Google. We actually go down to the Dead Sea uh, and stop and have lunch there and then continue on south uh, to Wadi Musa. And then when we're done there, a little bit further south to Wadi Rum, which is down here right at the southern tip of Jordan. So first stop is the Dead Sea. There's all these markers around that show you how far below sea level you are, you know, almost 400 meters, which is every bit of 1300 feet below sea level. Of course, everybody knows Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. Um, and the, the saline content of the Dead Sea is many times more than the ocean. So um, look at everybody, look at this guy over here on the left, you know, you 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 just bob like a cork in this in this heavily sa heavily salted water. I mean, that's the sensation. There's there's all kinds of signs that say keep your mouth shut, keep your eyes shut because it stings like crazy. But the sensation of of floating, um, you can almost like feel like you're sitting in a chair out there. It's just it's just great fun. It's one of those great experiences to have. There's a shot of the Dead Sea. So we just include that because it's right there. But of course, the, the real goal in Jordan is Petra. This is the, the uh, entryway as we head down towards the Great Seek, right? That, that narrow, narrow canyon that I think everybody's familiar with from the third Indiana Jones movie, right? The Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Um, there was no uh, CGI in those last scenes of that movie. Those are all... Um, filmed right here in Petra. So this is the beginning of the Seek. Here's our group here getting ready to go in. You might take note that it's a little bit cooler in Jordan than it is in Egypt. Everybody's bundled up with their jackets on. Um, and then it's about a mile and a half walk through this absolutely stunning uh, canyon. And then as you near the end, you start to see the bright sunlight where it opens up into the great valley of Petra. And the first thing you see is the treasury. Um, and this is, uh, you know, obviously, you know, cut right out of the cliffside here. There's nothing inside, right? You can go inside, but there's, there's, there's just a very shallow uh, room in there. This is not like the entrance to some labyrinth. Certainly not what you saw in the movie, but but super impressive, right? This is this is the lost city of the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans were an Arab uh, uh, tribal group that um, sort of uh, coalesced into a society between the fourth and the second century BC. They became wealthy traders. Um, they were sort of the terminal end of a, of a trade route that stretched into Persia, became really, really wealthy, and they, they made their capital city here at Petra with some really amazing and creative um, uh, um, um, 
hydro engineering, bringing water into the valley. And it was a, a naturally protected area, right? And then, um, then they sort of disappeared, disappeared from history. Of course, the locals knew about Petra, but I believe it was early in the 18th century that Westerners rediscovered it. There was a Roman period. So there was, there's a, a, a Roman theater there as you wander down the Great Valley. And then all kinds of rock cut structures, tombs, monuments, etc., cetera, um, to the left and to the right, uh, the old market area from the Roman times. You can see off in the far distance on this shot, some of the tombs that are cut right out of the cliffside. There they are. And, and it's all this, this striated, uh, uh, brightly colored red and purple stone. It's, it's, it's quite impressive. Here you can see a little bit of those, the colors in this close up shot. And you can see here that this, uh, before it was all eroded, was something similar to the treasury, right? It's got that same uh, uh, structure in the middle, the columns, uh, just not as, as well preserved. Here's a better shot where you can see the, the really fun colors of the stone. And there are, there are three classic hikes that you can do in the Petra Valley. They all involve climbing. Um, I, the first time I was there, I did all three and it, I was probably, who I was probably 50 and it, it just about killed me. I wouldn't even attempt it today, but two out of three for any of our travelers that are fit and, and one out of three, you absolutely should not miss. The first one is to the sacred high places. There's a trail that leads all the way up uh, to the top. There's nothing really impressive to see on top, but all along the way up and down, you're passing structures like this one that you see. And you have a, a quite a impressive view down to Petra all the way around you. It's the one place that you can, I, it's not quite panoramic, but you can probably see 70% of Petra from the sacred high place. The second one, and actually I would say the one not to be missed is um, they call this the monastery. You can see again, it's pretty much the same architectural style as the others that, that we've seen. This is about an hour's worth of climbing to get up to it. Uh, it's a trail, um, but it's, it's just beautiful. Almost everybody will at least attempt this hike. And this is the trail, right? So I, I want to, it's, it's not treacherous. There's, a, there's a, actually a, a trail with steps um, the whole way, um, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's demanding, the, there's a price. The third one is the one that's absolutely spectacular. It's on the other side of the valley from the other two. In this shot, you can see the, the Roman theater that I showed you from ground level off here to the left. These are all the little Bedouin businesses here where they're selling trinkets and coffee and tea and whatnot. So this shot right here is taken from above all those tombs that I showed you before. And this is the reward. You come out basically right above the seek, looking down onto the treasury. This is that very first building. This is the valley that the seek opens up into, but now you're up above it, looking down and seeing the treasury. And the next one is the money shot. Look at that. I, I think this guy just hangs out and gets his picture taken, right? With his, with his donkey there. That's not Photoshop. He's really out there on that ledge, risking life and limb. I've got another one with my foot in the foreground, but I like this one better. And this is then looking back, you can see, this is where the seek comes back through here. If you can follow my cursor, goes around the corner and back around this way. So this is the, the very end of the seek looking back in the direction that you've come when you arrived in Petra. And this is the trail that has led up to that viewpoint. Absolutely spectacular. Um, I love the hotel we use here. It's right, I mean, it's literally a stone's throw from the entrance to the archeological site. Um, <clears throat> very, very comfortable. And um, they have incorporated some of the old Nabataean structures into the, uh, um, into the hotel itself. So they've got a cave bar that's an old Nabataean uh, uh, 
I don't know if, I hope it wasn't a tomb. That's a little creepy, but um, it was some sort of structure that the Nabataeans had excavated there out of the stones. And then on your departure, you stop at an overview and you look back and you just have to have somebody tell you that this is the seek right here that leads back into Petra. And you, you can see how it remained completely unknown and, 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 and hidden from the Western world for centuries, right? Unless you had a Bedouin who took you back in there, how would you ever find that seek looking at this scene? It gives you a good sense of, of how it had remained a secret for all those all those centuries. Um, final stop on the tour then is Wadi Rum. We had taken Wadi Rum out in 2020, but we're putting it back in. Uh, Wadi Rum is this desert area on the south of Jordan. It's quite famous as a um, as a movie. Uh, um, site, right? A, a place to film. This is where Lawrence of Arabia was filmed. This is where The Martian was filmed. And you can see as I move along why anytime they want to represent some, some extraterrestrial world, why they would shoot it here at Wadi Rum. Uh, first, you, uh, we arrive, get into four-wheel drive Jeeps. We have a fun uh, tour of Wadi Rum. There's, there's a number of fun things to see, including this great big red sand dune. Climb all the way up on top. And then this is the view. Can, can you see why they would use that for the landscape of Mars? Spectacular. There's a couple of seeks to explore. There's uh, three or four of these natural stone bridges. And then we stay in a pretty rustic uh, Bedouin campground. Um, these are permanent tents, but you know, you're roughing it. There's a, a bathhouse, a, a toilet house that's separate from those. Um, we have upgraded this one as well for 2021, 2022. Um, they'll still be tents, but you'll have your own private facilities for those of you for whom that's important. Um, but this is getting toward the end of the day. You see the, the dusk coming on. Uh, Absolutely, no matter where we stay, you'll have a Bedouin dinner that they've cooked in a pit in the ground. Uh, this, this is a great meal. And then sunset is always a big highlight. There's our friend A from Thailand. Some of you might recognize her. And this is what it looks like as dusk falls and Wadi Room. But it's, it's beautiful at any time of day. And you might run into some camels. And that is pretty much the tour. There's just my camel shot of the treasury. And I'm closing with a picture of the pyramid again because it's so iconic. Um, that is it. It's 14 days and you will be exhausted, not physically, but emotionally, just because of all the amazing things uh, that you'll see while you're there. Sarah, have wow. you got anything else to add or has anybody else uh, chimed in with comments or questions? Um, I think that we've pretty much covered it. Why don't you um, uh, do the stop the screen share? Ah, of course. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So yeah, so I just wanted to um, comment that if people are interested in joining us uh, for this adventure, like I said, we are full for 2022, but we are potentially thinking about doing a 2021 um, tour. There was somebody who asked about the State Department warnings, which there is a do not travel State Department warning right now because of COVID. Uh, but I imagine that's probably going to change pretty quickly here since, especially if you are vaccinated, which a lot of people are also wondering, um, do I need to be vaccinated? And probably you do. Uh, most airlines are probably going to be requiring that. And I think also our insurer very well may require that. So that's probably something that will be required to travel with us. Uh, but if you are interested in, in finding out more about our itinerary, you can go to imprinttours.com. It has the detailed itinerary plus all the pricing and all that same prices, right? That you you have listed now, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And we do take single travelers. I know we've got a lot of women out here who follow me who travel by themselves, and we are happy to take you as a single traveler. There is a single supplement, but if you want a roommate, you can also just let us know. And if we happen to have a couple of women who are both looking for roommates, we can 
pair you up. So, uh, and if you can't make it this fall and you can't make it in 2022, I do promise I will offer it in 2023 because this is a destination that I think everybody should see. I really do. I mean, I just think it's it's a good idea. So you will absolutely enjoy it. I think uh, as I did, I was stunned every day. So any other thoughts, Reed? Only that this, this idea of maybe adding another departure for November, I, I can't tell you how exciting that is. Not, not just because we're all so hungry to travel, but you just couldn't pick a better place to go to to restart your travel enthusiasm or your travel engine. And and yes, I know there's some concerns. I want to make one quick comment about the State Department. The State Department is um, it's it's a microcosm of the whole United States. They're afraid of being sued, right? I mean, not that you would sue the State Department, but they will err so far on the side of caution as to be. I don't want to be dismissive, but I would say this, before I would ever make a decision about a destination, I would look at some travelers bulletin boards to see what travelers on the ground are saying, not what the State Department is saying about whether a place is safe or not. Um, I, you know, as I said, I, I have always felt extremely, extremely safe in Egypt. And if, if anybody has an itch to travel and you could go in November, I, I just think it would be a spectacular way to, to get the travel engine running again. Yeah, and just as you, for a little side note, they just upped the level of warning for Italy. <laughs> so, you know, it's just all COVID related. So if you are uh, vaccinated, I don't think you need to worry about that stuff. So I'm almost there, I have one more shot. So um, I, yeah, and another thing was airlines, how to get there. You can fly there through uh, Paris and through Amsterdam for sure. There's a lot of other routes that you could take. There are even some direct flights from, uh, from New York, from the Eastern seaboard of the United States. So you have lots of choices and Cairo is very, very well served. Uh, by Egypt Air and a bunch of other major airlines. You can fly through Turkey. That's another really easy way to go. And Turkish Airlines is flying everywhere right now. So, and that's, well, that's, that's a really so nice fun. airline, by the way. Yeah, it is. So this has been so fun doing this together, Reed. We never do it yeah. together. We just really should. <laughs> I think we should. I liked it. I did too. <laughs> well, thanks for watching everybody. Uh, our presentation today, um, next week. What do we have coming up next week, Reed? Do you remember? I should yes, look. we're doing Morocco next week. All right, tell me about that. What do we got planned? The Danube River again after the week after that. Okay, what do we have planned for Morocco? Uh, I've got uh, uh, our friend Ayub uh, scheduled to do a uh, coffee chat on Monday, and then he's working on a virtual tour. He lives in uh, Marrakesh. Uh, and then I'm, I'm still hoping to hear back from one of our other contacts there uh, to appear as well. And of course, we'll have a, a PowerPoint. And I'm sure, Sarah, that you will do some fun Moroccan cooking, maybe a tagine or something uh, uh, at uh, Cucina Quarantina. So I'm actually going to buy myself a tagine this weekend because I've always wanted one. I thought about buying one when I was in Marrakesh, but I didn't want to carry it back. So tagine cooking next week. Moroccan food is so much fun. So join us next week, starting on Monday. Like always, for Where in the World, we're going to be featuring Morocco. And thank you so much, Reed. It's been a really great week. I appreciate your organizing it. My pleasure. It's always fun. All right, everybody. See you later. Thanks a lot for joining us. Bye-bye, everyone.